dates back to 1872. There has been some dispute between that. The family members have reached out and said that that information isn't completely correct, but we do know that there is an individual buried there. But our earliest date in the Pioneer Cemetery is 1872. This cemetery wasn't opened until 1912. In 1912, they brought over some of the families from the Pioneer Cemetery wanted everybody brought together. And so they brought some over. We also have such as Mr. Hess here. Um, he was brought over from the Bliss Cemetery. They closed that cemetery over in Bliss and they moved some of them to the Hagerman Cemetery and some of them have been brought over to this cemetery. So they took, you know, we did, we, um, we were in Carson City and we had the same kind of thing with the cemetery. They had like people that were interred in one spot then they turned around and moved everybody to a bigger cemetery. So that's kind of what's going on right. here. So they were in another spot. So what happened to the land that they were buried on? The church owned it, and I'm not 100% positive what the church is still there, and I don't know what the reason why. And I myself didn't even know that they had moved those individuals until this last Memorial Day when that family came to visit, and we got to sharing stories back and forth. And she mentioned that that family member had been moved over. So when Elmwood Cemetery, when it was created, when, when, when the land and everything that was there, this wasn't the original cemetery where the people of Goodings and Twins Falls and all them things in this area. Where is the original cemetery where most of the older graves are? Are they here? So the original cemetery is the Pioneer Cemetery, which lay, lies about a mile to the east of us. Okay. Um, let me grab this book here. Um, According to the news article that was put together, this book was put together by Annie Bolton. Annie Bolton was the one who put our Chimes house together for us in 77. Uh, before that, we didn't have a restroom or a, plump, uh, a pump house out here, and she designed and had this building and raised the money to build this building. It took her 10 years to, to raise the funds for it. According to the newspaper articles, <coughs> Pioneer Cemetery, which lies at that point in time, would have been part of the Lincoln County, which is Shoshone area. Okay. And <coughs> they, at that point in time, Gooding was called Toponis. Toponis. And then when it became Gooding County, then they changed it over. And then what, as we begin to see that Toponis was growing, then they moved it over to here. They didn't move here till 1912, and Gooding became a area or a settlement in 1909. And so it was three years later that they bought this ground and they paid $5,000 for the original 20 acres out here. And so, you know, Earl, I have a question, okay? It said, so there's a little bit of everybody that's buried here in Elmwood Cemetery. Like right. most of the older people you're saying they're in the Pioneer Cemetery. And but here, you know, this is mostly where everybody did, like from you said, from around 18 something, the grave started. Mm -hmm. and yep, came here until, the, until present day, present. right? Correct. And so, my question is because I'm also I'm a big historian buff, and a lot of things that I do is that I know that there's a lot of unknown history. Mm -hmm about Idaho and I know about Camp Minidoka and I know about Rupert that mm -hmm. was there. There was another one for like Germans and then there was one for the Japanese. Are any of those people, are they buried here in Goodings or what, what happened when they passed away and everything like Minidoka, the Japanese one. I know a lot of the boys from there went off the war. 9,000 people died from there. And I know Rupert, we brought them over because they were Nazi you know, criminals and everything. I understand they worked the farming. I, I see, as I told you, I'm a big history right. buff when it comes to things. And I know that you know they got good wages and everything like this but when those people passed away where did they go i am not positive if we have any of those laid rest in our cemetery mm -hmm. i do know that some of the lodging the homes around this area came from those internment camps um there's a few that i visited throughout the time that i've grown up in here in goody that those buildings did come over but if individual i know that we have different nationalities buried here but where they came from exactly yet, I haven't been able to piece that. And that's together. good that you said there's a key point about that. You said certain buildings, because I know that we're at the Gooding Inn now. It used to be the Get Inn, and it was right there at the Old Tuberculosis Hospital. Mm -hmm. And they said that at the end of 1945 or at the end of the war, they said that at the auction happened, and they said that a lot of the buildings and a lot of things were auctioned off, and they came into Gooding. And they also said that one of those properties went into the tuberculosis hospital and that's how they were able to increase their bids by 70. Yeah. 
And that I don't know a whole lot of history on, but I, I'm aware of a little bit of that. And you know, and that's what, that's, that's what led me to you. Uh, yes. And that's what led me to come here because you were giving us that insight that most people don't get to see is because people, they just think, oh, I'm going into a cemetery, oh, I'm going this, I'm going bury they think sadness, and people are joy, but they don't understand that the history of the cemetery itself. And speaking of that history, and the, as you mentioned, around the war period, at this point in time, we roughly have about 730, into, 730 veterans laid to rest out here. Wow. Our veterans go clear back to the Civil War. We do have a gentleman... Uh, that is laid to rest out here, and I'm drawing a blank at the time being. Um, he was a Civil War vet, and he was also a Medal of Honor recipient. Wow. And he, there's a really long article on that that I can get to you. And he came out here, his family already came out, and then he came out, and then they laid him to rest after he'd been here for quite some time. Um, we have them all the way through World War One, World War Two. And now we're starting to get into our Korean and Vietnam veterans and things. And, and you know, and I also, um, Mr. Rao, I also heard that some of the founding members of Goodings that helped found, you know, this, you know, the town and everything of Goodings, they said, are they buried here in Elmwood or are they buried in Pioneer? So they're buried in both. According to this article, a lot of the Pioneer ones are buried in both areas, but Gooding, who it's named after Mr. Gooding, Frank mm -hmm. Gooding, who was a U.S. Senator, and I'm going to get my words wrong, so I won't go into too many details on that, but he and, he and his family are laid to rest out here. We can go out and see his headstone as well. Okay. Um, there are a few others that were representatives in the government and things like that. We'll so, the, so, so pretty much it's, it, it's got a little bit of everybody that you know what they had something to do with this area that's what the beauty of this whole thing and the reason that this interview is so important to our investigations our documentary and everything that we're doing is because if we don't know we know where they came from but we don't know where they they rest in and you know and i like my granny always you know try to tell me that you know rest in bones hold you know and that's that's where that's where the truth is at and so, you know, and it's like, because some people I've noticed that in areas of Idaho and all the places that we got is that, yeah, they were immigrants from someplace else. They came, they found it, they did what it is, but a lot of them don't get buried where they, where they do. They go and they go back home or they go, you know, back to what it is like this. And it's good to be able to come into a cemetery where Goodings. I have been fortunate enough to work in the funeral industry for roughly the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, to give you an age range, I'm only 33, so I've been in it for quite some time. But I've seen, and I'm grateful for cemeteries. Um, working with the funeral industry, the a lot of it's going cremation. A lot of those are choosing yes. to hang on to those or to spread them on the favorite camping spot or this or that place. Mm -hmm. And but to be able to have a place in three generations to go back to and find these stories are starting to fail and f fade out because there's nowhere to go and look at so and so's headstone. We had a chance just Friday. There was a family that come, and they knew that their grandparents and their great grandparents were here, but they didn't know one of them actually had a child. And late to the rest, next to the headstone was that child. So that family member said they were actually going to have to go do some family research, because according to our records, that child was their child, but the family was not aware of that. Wow! And so they were able to piece things together, and now have to go do further research because they weren't aware that that parents actually had. You see, that's the beauty of it. It's like you going into a history book that's not even written, but graves don't lie. Exactly. You know, and people don't understand, like, you know, the semblance of what the gravestones and all those things are what they truly mean is that that's not just giving reverence to your loved ones. That's like saying that's my mark in history. That's my mark in the world. That's going to go on for times and times. That's why we have the pyramids in Egypt. That's why we have these different grave markers and all these things from around the world is that they give that semblance to people that generations like us can go and say, you know what? Oh man, such and such was buried here and they did such and such. And you know what? And it makes you go back and you want to research the history. It makes you want to do that because I'm not from, I'm not a native from right here. Me and my sister, my family, we're from Florida. I was born in Mobile, Alabama, okay? Uh -huh. And the graves out there are completely, totally different than what the <laughs> graves is out here. Because number one, we can't dig too deep because we get war. Right. Okay. And we do have one, we do have a mausoleum out here. The couple aren't in it yet, they're still with us. 
but they wanted a resting place above ground and so they do have a muscle. So they got that here. old school and this is this is reminding me so much of back home because if you live there then you won't be, you won't get buried there. And like my granny, she was she lived might have lived in Pensacola, but she was born in Pollard, Alabama. That's thirty minutes. Where my grandmama got buried next to her mama, next to their mama, and everything. So when we go, our whole genealogy is like right, right there. And that's what I'm liking about this is that is you you not I'm not just coming to a cemetery and they say oh well, no there's the history of the land. The individuals that are here is mind-boggling. The I someday I wanted the ability to be able to see where the families went from Goody, mm -hmm. because I would guarantee that we are spread clear across the United States from the individuals laid the rest out here. But not even that. Think about all the immigrants that you had coming here that came here, and now their families have gone that direction, or they're gone home. back home. Mm -hmm. And then, but you, but you hold in the rights to let you know that these people were here. This was not just no, a legend. These people did, came yes. from Italy. These people are Irishmen. We have the Native Americans. We have, I even, you know, there's, there's even a brief African American history that came into right. here. And, and what's the beauty about Idaho is that they weren't slaves. Right. And I, I read that. I get goosebumps. I'm sorry, Earl, because I was like, we're in the middle of the United States, the world, we're right there, we're right there in the middle. And all of these people, even in Utah, they came to mine the mines. They came to seek their fortunes. We did Virginia City out there, and we went out there, we did the Mackey Mansion, and we did all of that stuff out there. We went to the cemeteries out there and everything. And I was like, oh my goodness, and then it comes to dawn on me. If it wasn't for this mine, we wouldn't have San Francisco. We wouldn't have been able to fund our wars. We wouldn't have been able to do anything. And these people are buried here. And then there's ones that don't even have a grave because they died in the mines. And then they just put something on top of it. We have several that way that are just simple marked with a stone. We're not positive where they're at exactly, especially in the Pioneer Cemetery. We believe that there's roughly about 190 people laid to rest out there. Wow. But their headstones were wood or something else, and for one reason or another, they got and shuffled or moved. Um, it wasn't until the 70s that they finally went in and planted grass. It was sagebrush over there. Um, the chairman of our board, he actually grew up right in this area of our cemetery board, and he remembers as a child playing out and running through the sagebrush. And causing havoc out there. So do you have a lot of, because I know in Utah, when we go in a lot of mining towns, a lot of ghost towns, they have a lot of unknown graves. All it is is it's the cross and it says unknown on it. Um, we've been real fortunate in our area that our secretaries and those have kept really fantastic records. As far as I know, in the Elmwood Cemetery, we know who is in every spot. Okay. It may not be marked for one reason or another that the family chose not to, um, especially through the 30s. There's a whole lot of stones out here that have what we call temporary markers on that a young man came through for a service project and placed markers on those. But those temporary markers are finally starting to fall off. But in the Elmwood, we know where everybody's at. Our records have been kept very well, so but you the know Pioneer, everything. not quite so well. So you could just be walking in Pioneer Cemetery, and you could be like, whoopsie. Yeah. Like, I didn't even know that, buddy. Even just some grass right, right. there. Okay. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my God. I'm right. sorry. So, so. Knowing, so knowing that when we're walking here, we're going to know exactly what we're doing like so. this. And from this history of being here in, in the Chimes House, where do you want to go next? So I figure we can start with Mr. Frank Gooding, since okay. he's the one, and then we'll go, we can go to the Civil War vet, and we'll end up down around where, what we call the soldier's block, Okay. and then we can end around a few other places. Um, there was the Gibbons building, we can stop by Mr. Gibbons' grave, he had the Gibbons Elementary on the Main Street, which is now the Charter School, okay. the Academy on Main Street, there used to be Mr. Gibbons Elementary. And then there was the Franz School. Um, they were two sisters. Between the two, they taught roughly 90 years together. And they lost both of their fiancés in the war, and neither of them married. I had a chance to visit with that family this summer when they were here for Memorial Weekend. And the stories that could be told, we could go on for hours. But yeah. it's just a lot, but you know what? We in your hands right now. So yeah. wherever you want to go next, I like to and my one thing is these records right here. I haven't seen old index cards like this since I was in school. So we don't use these much anymore. I keep them for fun's sake. Um 
because they have little stories. So when people mm -hmm. come looking for the information on some of the older graves, I can find it. The newer graves is all kept down at the local, I mean, where our cemetery office is now. So, so Earl Jenkins, they say that Earl Jenkins is here. So it, would it be categorized under E or under J? How? It would be under his last name. And so we look under, and how would you spell Jenkins? Everybody um, spells things a little different. It is J-E-N-K-I-N-S. Earl Arthur, and he is in section 4, row 30. Grade 12, died in 1960. Mm -hmm. And so we ought to be able to find you in this box here. <clears throat> this is incredible. I can't believe just like that we're just went from I'm hearing Earl in my head to Earl telling us where Earl is at. Oh my goodness, man. <clears throat> For all our people live, yes, we're here at the Elmo Cemetery. We're giving a little tour right now of what's going on by our friend Mr. Earl right here and he's laying it down for us okay and he's letting us know what's going on and last night if you were watching the live video the spirit that came to me name was Earl. Earl is the one that is showing us where Earl is laid here. So according to Earl's card he was born in 1935 he died in 19, 1960 Wednesday November 16th at age 25. He's laid to rest. His deed was sold to J.B. I can't read cursive. Um, it says patient or passion. Patient. And so, and then the funeral was Saturday, November nineteenth. So three days later, they laid him to rest. So how many people here in Elma Cemetery passed away at um, at the tuberculosis hospital? That I would not be able to tell you. I don't know that record. So then, then where did they bury the dead when they died at the, um, the hospital? I would assume they brought him out here. I, this is our main cemetery, so mm -hmm. I would assume they would come here, but what that number is, I can't tell you. I do know that we roughly have about 5,080 individuals laid to rest here in the Elmwood Cemetery. Okay. To give you an idea, our town itself is only about three, three to 4,000 individuals. So, so, so the cemetery like itself is larger than the town itself. Wow. Um, the old That's cards, crazy. this particular card has more information. This was Mrs. Leeper. I put the wrong card. This is Mrs. Leeper, Emma. Emma was born in 1908. She died in Salt Lake City. She was on the train and took sick and died there. The body was then brought to Idaho for burial. She was mourned to the lot. I apologize. To died June 14, 1908 and was born in 1862. At age 46, she was married to Mr. Leeper. He died not until 1938, so roughly another 60 years later, if I do my math right. Um, he was buried down in California in Los Angeles. She was a grandmother too and gives that information. She left Texas and got sick getting Awesome in Salt she Lake. Sold her, house. her husband sold the farm down there in Texas where she had resided. They had 11 children. When she got to Salt Lake, got ill, got off the train to see a doctor. She passed away. They put her back on the train with the seven children that she had with her. They brought her and the seven children to her husband and then they laid her to rest here. Wow, that's so that's, a, that's a lot of information that is going okay. down in history. So right you there. know what, we're going to take a little break right now and we're going to discuss to 8, 1928, 
And to be honest, to tell you, you're standing on him. <laughs> so he's not going to complain all that much. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm already in bad terms with Earl. <laughs> oh, okay. No, Mr. So. Frank, I'm like, hey. <laughs> so this is Frank Gooding. He's the one that founded Gooding. He's also the one that founded the Deaf and Blind School for those that are in the heart of hearing and also the sight isn't quite as well. And that's the, what they have down here. And he's the one that put all that together. Some of the family is laid here to rest. He's part of the Schubert family. Um, I believe one of the Schuberts was his daughter, and that's who the Schubert Theater downtown is part of. And a lot of history there as well. And part of the family is also buried over in that section. There's goodings over there as well. So they didn't keep them all together? And why they've got some over there, I don't know. And we do still have goodings in getting here. You think maybe they was the outcasts? I don't believe so. So, as far as I know, everybody got along pretty well, but every everyone has their story. And is this so, so Frank Goodings was the original founder? Correct. Yep. And John M. Goodings. And I'm not sure who they all are. I've been. This out could be his father. Because that's mm. 1859, and this mm. is 1884. Right. So he was born in 84. He was born in 59. 59. So John possibly is his son would be more of what oh, I would say his, uh, because that stone is 30 years, 20 some years ever. See how you look at stuff and then things all start to... Another cool thing about our cemetery is as far as I know, according to the records, when they built the Chimes House in 77, Gooding was one of seven cemeteries that everybody laid north and south. Gooding, as far as I know now, is the only one that everybody now lays north and south. The rest of your cemeteries will all, 90% of them run east and west. Wow, that's yeah. a piece of interesting interest um, right there. A lot of your bel different beliefs believe that <laughs> the sun rises from the east, so yes, you rise Muslims, to face the east. Yes. And so a lot of places will face their doors to face the east, be Native American or whichever. Um, a lot of Christians believe Christ will come from the east. And so they lay, lay the foot to the east, so you rise to the east. But they started our cemetery with the first grave in 1912, running north and south, and we've continued that direction. I and where's some, the first grave laid? That well, we don't know. I don't know the first one. I know the oldest grave is right over here in the Devaney family. It is 1905. He was one of the ones brought over from the Pioneer Cemetery. And the next one is 1909, and she came down from up by Fairfield. We Idaho. have Amanda. Yeah. Francis here from 1909 to 1925. Mm -hmm. So that was a fairly young lady. She, correct. So and she probably may have been moved over from the Pioneer Cemetery because this one didn't open until 1912. Oh, so that's so, the thing that you know we got to think about it. That if anything from 19 from ni above 1912, they were brought from another cemetery here. That's, um, that's do you know anything about the grave that has the two kids together dying on the same day? I don't know anything on that one. Um, is that the one that says the twins on it? No, okay. they're three years apart. They're three years apart. I don't know that one. Um, we do have one up here that's twins that they passed on the same day, but I don't know the, the circumstances behind that one either. So, what was that? You don't know the circumstances behind that one I don't. <laughs> um, this stone here is unique to some people in our community. They call it the mother stone. Um, this particular stone you can rock. And some people say they've had different experiences with it. I myself have not. But I visited with the lady earlier this month. And ever since she was in high school, they've always enjoyed that particular stone and coming out and visiting with the mother stone. You can rock and it. What so, do you mean? It goes back and forth. So some of the older stones aren't secure down so you can oh, rock it. Oh my goodness. Okay. Oh my God. And for me, it doesn't do anything for me, but to that particular individual, she says that it does something for her. Um, we get a little nervous though with people rocking them. In 88, we had some individuals come out and push over about 100 stones. <gasps> oh. And they did some little bit of damage to quite a few of them. Luckily, things weren't too bad and they were able to repair most of them or get them stood back up with minimal damage. See that's wrong. So That's wrong. 
I don't, I don't. I know, I like that one. Now, since you had told me that about anything above 1912, I'm looking at all of these graves now, 1890. So that anything one's behind. 19, anything. Anything. So 1911 would have come from the Pioneer Cemetery. So that 1890, uh, Warren C. Paul came but from. But that's it. his birthday. So that, you've got a Death date. So oh, the death date. Okay, now, I'm getting that cemetery lingology going now. 1890 is his birth date. He didn't pass till 1936. Okay. when he passed. Dang, 1885, and they died in 1970. Yeah. They lived a long life, man. And during them times, I can't believe people were actually living that living. long. And like that. It shocks me how many there. stones out here actually were into their 80s, 90s out here. Okay, where's our next adventure to? We ain't seen Mr. Good and we know where he's at. Um, we'll walk up this direction. Okay. <coughs> Burger. These, these graves came from another grave. That was 1914. And they passed away. Well, we opened in 1912, so they'd have been here. They, so they just. This is like one I'd like to know the backstory on. Um, they this probably would have been a hand etched stone, but in the bottom it says here rest a woodman of the world. And so I'd have really liked to have known what his talent was, and where he came from, and what his story was. It's a beautiful grave. It's a, it's a marble. I'm not sure what stone, which the stones are. And a lot of these stones would have had to come in from other places, because as you look around here, there's only lava rock. And so they had either had to brought them back from east. I understand that there is a quarry up in Boise, but what's where the stones would have come from? Uh, Do you have a lot of masons there? Here? There are a lot of masons. Masons at one point in time was a very large organization here in Gooding mm -hmm. and it's slowly just as any other organization with the next generation coming up not as interested mm -hmm. in joining those. Okay. So, over this direction we have the Tom Thomas family or Thompson family. Poor baby. So the Thompson family here, if I understand correctly, they owned the Demarais Funeral Chapel down on Main Street. Okay. Before they built that chapel, they actually had Thompson's furniture and funeral parlor down on Main Street, which is now um, Wilson's Bates Furniture. So this is not just a marker, they're, they're actually, the bodies are interred here. So the bodies are on the back side, the okay. headstone is on the north side, and then we lay the individual rest on the back side of the stone. So today you would be standing on these individuals' plots oh, behind okay. us. And so the Thompson family, and this oh, is their family oh, stone, and so they've got several individuals buried around that are all related to them as well. So it looks like they didn't give them too much space between each headstone. So. Our plots are laid out at four foot, eight foot, or ten foot long, four foot wide. And we don't, we try to get them to place the stones as tight as possible. That way we don't have weeds growing up in between. It makes carrying for it a whole lot easier. Okay. So that was the, the funeral director. Yes, ma'am. Why is this in this tree like this? So this here is what we call our row marker. Okay. So when people come to our cemetery, our cemetery is split into four sections. Okay. And then, so you've got section one, two, three, and four, and then we split them into rows. That way, if we give you your information, you can come on and find the name, section three, oh, so row they help 17, grave yes. 12. And so this would be 
Um, the one behind you over here is actually painted. This one we missed during Memorial Day. But it's got an S here for section 2, an R for row 15, and then it's got grays. This tree would have been probably planted after it was <coughs> laid to rest. So it was well, after these individuals were laid to rest. And when the row marker would put, that tree would have been real little. And that tree is just over and grown around that So row this tree there. is pretty much grew up around I would say that that tree went in after 1943 and so it's taken over everything. Wow. Um, Mr. Devaney, James Devaney here is our oldest one that I'm aware of in the cemetery. He passed away in 1905 and he's the one that the family brought over from the Pioneer Cemetery. And that way they're all laid to rest here. So this section's interesting. So what the family chose to do, this is the family stone here, the Devaney headstone. So these four individuals are actually laid to rest. Their heads lie up here. So they put their stones at their feet. And then the three Devaneys that are down there are actually laid to rest where those headstones are at. And then and they have so, their family too. And then this is the family stone here. Wow, that's interesting. I've, I, you know what? This cemetery has the way that they're doing this. This is interesting. The way that this cemetery is laid out like this. I wonder what was going through the person who founded this cemetery. I wonder what they were going through. What made them want to be different? I like. Everybody. There's a lot of questions I'd like to answer. You know, because that kind of makes me the way that you say that the, they're they're buried. It kind of makes me wonder about their orientation of religion or because back then they played that played a lot on everything so but why would somebody do this some people tell me he was challenged the first one that was dug was challenged it was directionally challenged and so that's how he dug it and they just followed suit after that because the pioneer cemetery over there is east and west mm -hmm. but this one runs north and south and we have individuals that refuse to be buried in this cemetery for that reason. They actually own really? plot. They grew up here. They lived here their entire life, but they have plots either in Shoshone or Wendell. But they won't be buried here. Because this is... Be this because is it runs north and south instead of east and west. And wow. Wow. That's, <clears throat> that's kind of crazy. So up front of this section here is what we call our soldier's plot. There's the four large stones that start it, and those four large stones are individuals that were actually killed in action. Um, one of them was actually killed over in Belgium, and if I read the instructions and everything correctly on the papers and things, he was laid to rest over there, and the family said, no, we want him brought home. So they disinterned him from over there, brought him here. He was on display at the Schubert Theater. They actually had military on both ends of his casket, honoring and guarding his cask for the time it was on display there and then they brought him out here with full military honors and laid him to rest here and during memorial today we have an opportunity the community comes out our american legion the vfw they come out and they place about 730 flags and the flags all stick up above the cat or the headstones out here and it's quite the sight to see I'm a military brat. My daddy was in the military. I traveled all over the world being that. That's why I'm always so interested. You see my complete attention went to this area right here because you know what? These people gave their lives for this country. These people gave their lives and didn't even, some of them didn't even get to come home when they, or their parents didn't get to see them, but they, but that's beautiful that they had the opportunity to be able to bring them back home. Yeah. And, and then they actually let them be buried in the cemetery since it's, 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 it's not the correct way. So it's. It's an honor to be out here. A lot of history out here. A lot of I wish at times headstones could tell me stories, and other times probably not. <laughs> so, what got so. you involved in wanting to do this? To do the pathway and to do what it is that you do? So, um, my the religion my family's belonged to has been a lifelong religion. Mm -hmm. My mother was involved in it a big time, and I was homeschooled till ninth grade. And any time there was an individual that passed, my mother being one of the ones in the women's organization. So are you an LDS? I'm, we now go by Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, okay. but guilty as charged and honored to be. But mom was a Relief Society president, and so we attended every funeral. And since I was homeschooled, I got through going and help setting up lunch tables and taking down things. 
And to me, death has never been the end. Mm -hmm. Ever since I was even little, it's always just been the graduation. But there's always got to be something better than this. What's yes. the point being on this earth? That's why we do what and, we do. And so, for me, I went and served my mission in, down in Albuquerque, New Mexico area, and loved it down there. Spent a lot of time down around that area, and I came home and decided that's what I wanted to get into. Um, but I'd heard a lot of horror stories that a lot of people after you get into it can't handle it emotionally for one reason or another and I didn't want to spend time and money into school and find out I couldn't handle it. So I went to the local funeral home, they said no we're not hiring and I tried and tried and couldn't get a job and so finally I said let me work for you one week. Without charge I'll volunteer my time just to see what this industry is like. And after one week they offered me a job and I worked for them for about a year and a half and then I tried to go to school but human anatomy and I don't get along when you got to spell it and read it and write it and yeah you can't do that and so uh, they offered me a job back without my schooling so by that point in time my wife and I had a handful of kids and we moved back and I worked for them for about two more years and then this position came open and I decided to come out here. That's your blessing. And so. but, uh, but you know I believe I'm a firm believer that people have their certain pathways in life It's either some people can take it or some people you cannot judge somebody everybody has a purpose and everybody has a need your need your job is so is more important than a lot of things because you're caring for people that people love I will agree 100 and that they care for and you're actually you know look at this this cemetery this cemetery I'm gonna tell you something it's clean you know what the energy is the first time I've come into a cemetery and I actually feel at peace thank you because I feel you know being a psychic medium and all these things like this I don't feel like there's any unrest. Now, what's killing me is that why is this one of the first cemeteries in the world that is facing? But we weren't the first of the time. There were seven of them back in the 70s. Come on now, all the cemeteries so, in the world. And we're, as far as I know now, we're one of the last ones to go this direction. Wow. And right. one of the funniest experiences that I've ever had was being in the funeral industry. We went to make a removal, and the law enforcement said, I don't know how you do your job. And law enforcement called on that particular one. And I said, to be honest with you, I don't know how you do your job. I said, I tell mine to stay, and they stay. They said, you turn your back on yours, and they might shoot you in the back. For real? But mine, <laughs> okay. it's all over. You ain't got so to worry I, about I quite enjoy my job, but I couldn't be a law enforcement. So, so you, so you're not the funeral home. You just that when they come and they need to be buried or they need to, you take care of all of that, the history, all you know, making sure is that you know that stuff is just like that. But that's different. By the time they come to you, they've already been prepared. They're already been in the casket. All you got to do is make sure you got a spot that they, they're going to spend the rest of eternity. Well, but I also though still work for the funeral home part time. Oh, okay. And so I still, I so still you get, get a involved. Piece. Yeah. Yes. Um, just actually before we came here, I had to run to Twin Falls. There was an individual that passed away over there that needed to taken care of, so I ran over there real fast and brought back. And then the funeral home will go ahead and continue to take care of them. You know what? That's, I, I'm, so. I tell people like this. People think, you know, they, they think things like this is morbid and McCary and all these things. And I look at it like this is that this is a piece of your history. Your mother, your father, your grandmother. You know, to me, I believe in ancestral you know our belief and our belief path and where I came from and where my granny came from and everything they we believe that our ancestors are our power mm -hmm. and by coming here I always give respect I always either leave some copper at the gates or I, my granny told me you got to give respect to the dead and that's what we're doing like this. so what's the next thing you want to show us while we're out here we we'll so walk up this direction there's a quote that I carry in my pocket and I'm a firm believer in that quote <clears throat> Let's see. It was removed British statement Sir William Gladstone who said, show me the manner in which the nation cares for the dead and I will measure with mathematical exactness to tender mercies of its people. Their respect for the laws of the land and the loyalty of the high end the um, Indels in educating families about permanent memorization and helping them make choices that are good for them, you will be making a long term difference in the community. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That so I'm a firm believer those that, just as you said, that your granny taught you to respect mm -hmm. the dead and to leave things that, it's, that we need to care for our ancestors. Because even in my house, I have ancestral altars and, well, you know, and everything just like that. Because I do come from 
the, the, the more of the African American side where people think that you know he but no it's all family based and everything I have altars I leave water I give food I do everything you know for the dead mm -hmm. you know and it's like I've been we've been like this our whole lives and it's like on their birthdays you know I got pictures of them I got memories you know and it's like they never left uh, us and that's the way it should be and too many anymore are not carrying on this is another stone that I will slowly but trying to learn history about that it's been here since 1931 and you can see that the gentleman who was actually born in 1851 and so he was 80 some years old and I'd like to know the more story on it an individual tell me one of the local families the Luther family is what the individual told me that were the ones that actually paid for this stone when it was installed but I haven't been able to gather any more information you know I'm that. saying that I'm starting to see a pattern here is that I think that when these people who died in their 80s and stuff from that time, they really didn't have any family members that were around them and they were aloners. They were alone at that time. And the people that grew to love them were, were, the the one, were the ones who took care of them and those are the ones that did it. And that's why I say written history, people, that's why people to this day cannot get history to the way that it is because we believe, I believe, that bardic entails being told from your grandparents, being told from your ancestors, those are the things that are not written. And so a lot, a lot of big piece, once they go, they take that history with, with them. them. And, and that's, I'm telling you, what I felt when you told me that, that's exactly what happened. He had already lost all his family. He had everything. And then there was somebody else who you said that came that considered him and loved him enough to give him this beautiful big head. So this kind of looks kind of English, kind of British. Kinda. And that's what I'd like to know where it came from. Um, because once again, it would be another one of those that would have had to come from elsewhere. Because we don't have rock around here like that. Um, a lot of also our immigrants in this area is the Basque culture mm -hmm. and a lot of those individuals and I'm not sure if that's a Basque name or not but there's a lot of the Basque culture. Try putting in Google um, what, what um, name turned into the silk and, when they came And I'm in. slowly working on that about until about three weeks ago I had a flip phone and computers and I didn't get along and I dropped my flip phone in a sprinkler system and my wife told me it's time to finally upgrade. <laughs> And so I'm slowly getting used to computers. I've never liked them <laughs> since I was in high school. Can we get a little bit of a close-up on this one right here? If I find out any so, information about this, I'll, make, awesome. I'll pass it down to you. Martin yeah. Silk. And where are your masons buried at? Anywhere and everywhere. Oh, That's the, the one so they didn't keep them all in one spot. And I had the chance to go down to the Salt Lake Cemetery about three years ago. My wife's grandmother passed away down there. And they've got them broke up. You have different groups, mm -hmm. organizations, different areas. And our cemetery, there's not an assigned Did you spot. go to the, the cemetery? Did you go to? Did you go to the big one that was on the hill by Capitol Hill? Yep. You should have went to the Mojave Park. Okay. That one is nothing but mausoleums all the way around. They got big old deer that come in and lay really? on the ground and everything. It's so beautiful. If you ever go, when I'll you go back to, go back to Salt there. Lake City, it's by the big university right there. There's a cemetery, and when you go there, it's like big old mausoleums. They look like houses and really? all kinds of, and they got big old deer elk I don't know what they are they should be <laughs> out there laying just chilling out in the thing I'm like I've never seen anything like that in my that's life that's another thing that's from where you're at and where we're at deer are about as big as <laughs> your deer are small aren't they <laughs> baby deers okay I saw one on the road over here and I almost had a heart attack I was like that ain't no deer I thought it was a chupacabra or something I was like you know I, I'm just being real I was like, so we'll head over here to section to four where Earl's buried at and we'll go find his grave yes that's so these are some of the temporary place I was telling you about earlier that so these graves weren't marked I apologize and so this would be an infant 1936 to 1938 and so somebody came in and they went ahead and put the the plates on actually both of those would have been infants and so who those children belong to possibly our family right here possibly there's so did spots. they bury the this person right here right um, Bard L, 1887 to 1931, and it says Leroy B, 1924, age six weeks. So did they bury them in the same grave? Or so our cemetery out here, um, we allow you to do one full burial and three cremains or two cremains on top. Okay. Um, what we've started in the last little while, or what they've been doing, is if it's an infant, they'll lay the infant to rest in the headstone roll. And that's possibly what they did here because the infant died in 1924 and Bard died in 31. So they possibly laid the head right under the headstone where the infant or the, is laid to rest 
and then the parent is laid to rest at the foot. Wow. Wow. <coughs> From what we saw, Earl's gravestone was a temporary plate as well. We about to see him now, ain't it? Earl might be pissed. <laughs> He's like, no, you gonna come to my grave? Why? <laughs> some good grass. Get healthy, strong grass. <laughs> okay. Get lost in this grass. Okay. Oh. Your sister. And so also in our cemetery, we'll allow you to place a military stone. And so this is Andrews, and this is his VA marker. <coughs> so I cleared that earlier, it was covered. <laughs> this time of year with the grass clippings, in the spring and in the fall, we bag it. But during the summer, we just let it mulch. But when the leaves start to fall, we'll go back to bagging, and then in the spring before Memorial, we'll bag everything that way. We don't end up with grass clippings on everything for Memorial weekend. And then about two weeks after Memorial, then we go just back to mulching. <clears throat> hey, hold on now. That's kind of deep. Mm -hmm. Now watch out now. I was like, I'm swimming. I'm getting over here to her. <laughs> be Earl. That would be the same card that we got earlier. And you said that you had found a newspaper clipping yes. that he had passed away at the TB hospital from tuberculosis. Earl and Earl. And Earl, who are you buried next to? Um. I'm horrible at pronouncing names, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> so you said those gravestones are the temporary ones? Correct. One? So how long did it sit here and be a temporary one? So it will sit here until the family chooses to, either the family or an individual chooses to replace it, such as this one here. The screws have rotted out. Those plates are only held in with two little screws right here. And over time, the water finally wears it out, or the ice in the wintertime will pop those free. And we lose about three or four a summer. Somebody came in, I think, in the early to mid-80s, and they did a service project and put these temporary markers on unmarked graves. So everybody in our cemetery, we know where everybody in the Elmwood Cemetery is, but now we're starting to lose plates. And so I have the book of the dead is what I call it mm. and so I can tell you where everybody's at out here and if I can't because of human error we have it all on hard copy on the computer and everything down at the main office and he can find it and so we've been trying to encourage individuals as they come out if they do have family members that have a metal plate to go ahead and replace it with a solid stone so in this area two summers ago um, I was helping a family find their child the child had passed when they were young and she since left the community and so I was helping her and I was walking across and I felt the spongy spot in the grass and I thought I need to go back and check that so after they left I went back and I stepped on that spongy spot and I fell in up to my knee and I went well that ain't good so I went and got my help I said we need to take care of that hole later and I bent over to see how deep the hole was and my lovely 
flip phone fell out of my pocket. Well, me being a father of seven and a tightwad, I wasn't willing to buy a new phone. I wanted my phone back. So <clears throat> I got myself down in the hole and down about this far to get my phone back and I couldn't reach it because the dirt had fallen in a cone shape and slid down to the bottom of the guy's grave. So I had to go home and get a pair of barbecue tongs and a flashlight to get my phone back. We tried to call it. So if you ever see movies where they're buried alive or whatever, yeah, your cell phone doesn't work two feet underground. And I, so we finally, and I asked the young man that was with me, I said, take a picture. Nobody's going to believe that I've crawled in up to my waist to get my cell phone back. He brought his cell phone out, went to turn the camera on, it came up white screen. Would not work the rest of the day. Went home that night, phone worked just fine. And so for some reason or another, we weren't allowed to take a picture of me getting my cell phone back out of the hole. They didn't want um, their spirits to be shown. So something there, um, which I found very unique, but he was kind enough to give me my phone back. So. Wow. Well, that pretty much you and gave us the, the lay down of what's going on at L1 Cemetery. And we can drive through Pioneer Cemetery, right? Yeah, um, you can drive up to it, but then you have to get out and walk. Okay. Um, there is the Luther graves at the back. They believe those were actually buried on the family ranch. And then later on they realized that they brought to bring them out to the, because according to our paperwork, they were later brought to that cemetery. And so we believe the family that I visited with believes they were probably buried on the family ranch okay. and then brought to lay to rest there. You can see some of the older stones up here, about halfway, about from row, 15, row 16 to about row 11, we call it the baby section they started putting half rows in. So instead of giving the family the full eight foot, they started cutting them in half because they were only needing that four foot for infants. And so through the 40s and the 30s, for some reason there were a lot of infants that passed away. And so we call that the baby section down there. And we still every now and then lay an infant to rest in that area. Most families anymore buy a plot where mom and dad then later can be laid to rest with that infant. But we just did one last summer that the family, they're not local, but they wanted the child laid to rest. It was a stillbirth, and they went ahead and laid to rest down there. And the mausoleum that you said? The mausoleum is over on that other side there, clear over in section one. Okay. And we can walk that direction and pass oh, the gibbon. You're going, you're going towards the end on that one. Bye, Earl. <laughs> An Earl in the ground. I know you're hostile with me. I didn't mean to, but I know I did. I did mean to. <laughs> Now we know where you at, Earl. I can't believe you actually exist. <laughs> wow. Only seven cemeteries, and this is the oldest one where they bury everybody from east to west. The only people that do that are in the Muslim culture. And then this is the Gibbons, that the Gibbons Elementary was named after. And it's now the Academy down on Main Street there. Gina, Eugene, and Doris. Wow. They're the ones that had the Gibbons Elementary downtown. Wow, they've she lived a lot a lot longer than he did. And so that's the um And then that's Demma Ray's there. <clears throat> Gotcha. And to get their burial plot, Demarais actually had to buy six burial spots 
to wow. be able to just lay the two of them to rest. To and be able what to was I asking about Masons? And he's part of the Masons. Get um, a close up, boys. He, him and his wife are very much into the Masons and the Daughters of the Jobs. And back of the Gibbons, you pointed out that she lived much longer than he did. The Simus here, um, he passed away. And then she turned around and passed away uh, 15 days later. No. No, yeah, she, she went passed passed first. Away. Hey, sorry. Hey, that's a broken so, heart right there. That's exactly. Just over two weeks. There. That's yeah. a broken heart. So, they had since moved up to Boise. And one passed, and then shortly the other one thereafter. Okay, but that's how we're going to do so with the Baker's Stone, it only has one date for Joyce? Mm -hmm. So that's Joyce's birthday. Joyce hasn't passed away yet. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So Everybody's going to let you know that we can have peace on what's going on in the cemetery. And we're getting ready to end this live video and get ready. We'll see you back again tonight at 12 for our last investigation at the Goodings Inn. Peace. For me, I actually, my wife and I decided to purchase ours this year. And so we went ahead and purchased ours so that we could be in the